Professor Daniel Crane, uh, who's going to talk about these interactions between rule of law, antitrust, and innovation. Then. Well, thanks very much, Aurelian, and uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak uh, this afternoon. And uh, I certainly feel inadequate to follow up on uh, Commissioner Wilson's uh, intellectual tour de force, uh, but I'll uh, give it my best shot. And um, I'm also just glorified, uh, gratified to uh, be speaking at uh, a, a, the Institute on Classical Liberalism. I, I just really like that formulation as against uh, sort of conservatism or progressivism, which is all we sort of hear about uh, in, in politics today, but to be reminded that there is uh, another view on the world, which um, uh, which is uh, grounded in in the individual uh, and responsibility and in, uh, in in sort of classical liberal ideas. So I'd like to focus my my remarks uh, on precautionary antitrust, on regulatory policy towards monopoly and dominance. Um, I've titled my remarks, uh, "What is the shelf life of dominance?" So in case you missed it, monopolization is back on the menu again. Uh, not only do we have the uh, the civil cases pending against companies like Google and Facebook, of course, uh, scores and scores of, of private cases ongoing. Uh, we also see legislative proposals uh, at the state and federal level to emulate the European Union uh, uh, on abuse of dominance. And uh, I think even more radically, to pick up on uh, Commissioner Wilson's observations, uh, we've been hearing from the Justice Department that they may begin bringing monopolization cases criminally again, uh, something that hasn't been done since uh, the 19, uh, late 60s, early 70s. It's been at least 50 years since we've seen uh, criminal anti uh, monopolization enforcement. So, so what could be behind that? Uh, I should plan to spend some time this summer really digging into uh, empirically what happened in those um, 80 something criminal monopolization cases brought in the earlier part of the 20th century. So um, I wanna focus on monopolization uh, and the precautionary principle. Now I should start by saying that I've never much cared for the precautionary principle as a principle of regulation. Um, as Cass Sunstein observed some time ago, the principle is literally paralyzing, forbidding inaction stringent regulation and everything in between. I'm frankly not sure how one would go about applying the precautionary principle to monopolization. Does it mean that we have to bring a lot more cases uh, or promulgate more ex ante rules to stop monopolization? Uh, or does it mean just the opposite, that we should not take any action against monopolies until we're quite sure that we're doing the right thing? So to Sunstein's point, I think the principle at that level really is, is paralyzing. Instead of a precautionary principle here, uh, I will say that it seems more uh, apt to invoke the error cost framework that Frank Easterbrook identified for antitrust law some, some years ago. Uh, what is the cost of not doing enough to stop monopolistic behavior? What is the cost of doing too much? Now, I'm going to focus my remarks almost entirely on the first question, the cost of false negatives, of doing too little uh, with respect to intervention as against dominance. And that raises the question, well, how bad really is the monopoly problem? I don't mean just right now at this precise moment in time, for example, how dominant are Google, Facebook, Apple, or Amazon. I mean, more generally, what is the record on how dominance arises, how long it lasts, how much damage it does while it's in place, and eventually how it gets displaced? The question of the damage that monopoly does while it's in place seems particularly relevant right now with respect to big tech. One of the interesting features of the current cases, investigations of big tech is that there's very little suggestion that big tech is charging consumers too much. Maybe on the ad tech side or the advertising side, one can make the case that there's overcharging happening, but certainly on the consumer side, uh, Google and Facebook offer nominally free services, which is why people like Tim Wu uh, have, have theories about attention merchants and so forth, so trying to redefine what is being paid, right? Um, even if you look at companies like Amazon that um, actually charge their customers for what they're buying, um, we know that Amazon prices tend, and especially we take into account uh, free delivery, uh, tend to be so low that rivals are complaining that they can't profitably compete. So we, we don't seem to have a problem of the current crop of monopolists uh, being accused of charging too much overall. Um, so maybe the problem is that they're not innovating enough. Is that the problem? Well, it's hard to make the claim with a straight face that big tech 
isn't innovating. Maybe they should be innovating more, but they're certainly innovating to a large degree. I mean, it, last year in 2021, Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon collectively spent $110 billion on R&D alone. Now, maybe they threw that away. Maybe it wasn't good innovation, uh, but they certainly are spending a lot of money uh, on trying to innovate. So I think that oftentimes the claims about the harms of dominance tend to focus not on the immediate, but on the longer term. Maybe over time, dominant firms become, as Judge Learned Hand described them in Alcoa, unchallenged economic power, deadens initiative, discourages thrift and depresses energy, immunity from competition is a narcotic, and rivalry is a stimulant to industrial progress. The spur of constant stress is necessary to counteract an inevitable disposition to let well enough alone or as Nobel laureate John Hicks saw it, that over time, a quiet life becomes the best monopoly profit. Well, there's an empirical question embedded in such claims about the cost of monopoly. How long does a monopolist trundle along enjoying the quiet life before it's displaced? Is the quiet, law, is the quiet life a long night's sleep or is it really a, a short siesta? To put the point in terms of error costs, if enjoyment of the quiet life invites prompt technological challenge and displacement, then perhaps there's less to worry about. Now, in antitrust circles, we're accustomed to hearing these questions framed in Schumpeter versus Arrow terms. Often the question is framed as whether innovation is more likely to arise in markets characterized by a dominant firm or rather in ones that are highly competitive. But there's actually, I think, a different question or claim lurking at the heart of Schumpeter's argument that capitalist economies are inherently characterized by what he calls perennial gales of creative destruction. It's not really about how much competition happens within a market, or maybe even about competition for the market in Harold Dimsetz's terms, but rather it's about innovations outside the market overtaking whatever else is happening within the market. So um, Arrow's replacement hypothesis that a monopolist has a diminished incentive to innovate because that would simply cannibalize its existing rents may be perfectly true as to innovation within a market, but as little to say about creative destruction that thunders in from outside a market and destroys and replaces the market entirely. So let's take Jeff Bezos' recent prediction that one day Amazon will go bankrupt. Surely not the best news to Amazon shareholders, but surely Bezos is right. One day that will happen. The question though is how that will happen and how soon that will happen. Will it happen by some other online retailer becoming better at doing Amazon's job than Amazon? Maybe, but I think the history of capitalism teaches that it's more likely that it'll happen by technology transforming the way that people buy and access goods and services, making the whole idea of an online retail platform obsolete. Well, but maybe that happens eventually, but it takes a long time, and maybe the process is significantly slowed by monopolistic behavior. Um, that would be the case for more aggressive intervention. So how do we judge the generality of the Schumpeterian claim? Let me suggest that one way to do this at least is by looking at the claims of those who argue that dominance is a serious long-term problem. Uh, my good friend, John Baker, who I, uh, from whom I have the greatest respect, uh, writes in his book, The Antitrust Paradigm, that market power is durable. And then he lists examples of the durability of market power and I very much appreciate they did that because it gives me a target list to work from. He cites General Motors, IBM, Eastman Kodak, RCA, US Steel, and Xerox as examples of firms whose monopolistic power lasted for decades. This is a peculiar choice of horribles to parade, but entirely serviceable to analyzing the resiliency of markets against long run dominance. The historical records suggest that each of these firms persisted as dominant for only so long as its technology was state of the art, after which most of them lost their status as market leaders and most of them went into bankruptcy or obsolescence. So 
indulge me in walking through these examples briefly. General Motors lost its dominance when smaller, more reliable, and more fuel efficient imports arrived from Europe and Asia, challenging its domestic hegemony. General Motors' market cap is now 18% of Tesla's market cap. Rivian, which just entered the market, has sold almost no cars yet, is creeping up on General Motors' market cap. The market is telling us what's going to happen to General Motors. GM was leapfrogged by technological innovation from outside the traditional US car market, both by foreign importation and then by the shift to electric vehicles. How about IBM? IBM was dominant in personal computers until it made the strategically fatal decisions to outsource operating systems to Microsoft and the chip to Intel, thus creating two computer juggernauts and relegating itself to a fringe player in personal computing. In 2004, IBM sold its PC business to the Chinese company Lenovo. It was the very assets that IBM thought so unimportant that it outsourced them to outside the PC market that ended up making IBM obsolete in personal computing. How about Eastman Kodak? Eastman Kodak was once seemingly impregnable in the film and camera market, but was reduced to bankruptcy by the advent of digital cameras and today does not sell cameras or film at all. Here again, the digitalization revolution took over photography from outside the camera market. RCA began its life as an independent company when General Electric was forced to divest the company as part of an antitrust decree in 1933. And then it had a successful run of innovation in television and film um, until about 1976, when RCA made the calamitous mistake of selling off its liquid crystal display business, thinking that this was unimportant to television. And of course, this was everything to television. And by 1985, RCA was a, 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 a defunct company, was reacquired by, by General Electric, uh, rolled into G General Electric's operations for brand reasons, but the company was effectively uh, liquidated or terminated. How about U.S. Steel? Uh, U.S. steel seemed commercially impregnable with the collapse of the German and Japanese steel industries at the end of the Second World War. By the 1950s, it was overtaken by European steel producers using innovative op op open oxygen production methods. Today, U.S. steel's global market share is around 5%. And then my favorite example, uh, Xerox. Xerox reminds me so much of Google because, of course, two Xerox became an almost generic verb that Xerox had to resist becoming genericized because people just equated the Xerox with the function of copying, right? Uh, like, like Google today, uh, same issue. But Xerox was only as dominant as its technology. And by the 1990s, when Canon came along with superior digital copying, particularly desktop printing solutions, Xerox was crushed. The company narrowly escaped bankruptcy and today is a shadow of its former self. In almost all of these cases, the dominant firm was destroyed by technological revolutions that happened outside of anything that the dominant firm could control. The shelf life of the company's dominance equaled the shelf life of its technological superiority. Particularly in technologically dynamic times, dominance is fleeting. 52% of the companies that were on the Fortune 500 in the year 2000 no longer exist today. And I will make a wager that in 20 years time, as between Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon, that at least two of those companies will be effectively def defunct. I hope someone's recording this so that in 20 years I can come back and say, I told you so if I'm right, and that people have forgotten it if, I, if I'm wrong. Now, admittedly, as to all these examples, we cannot rule out the possibility that these firms' long-term dominance was tamed by the enforcement of the antitrust laws. Each of these companies did experience some degree or another of antitrust prosecution, uh, even as to a company like IBM that, of course, won its antitrust battle when the government dismissed its case in 1982. It's possible that the antitrust law deterred the company from more aggressive behavior that in turn hastened the Schumpeterian moment. So I'm not suggesting that because dominance is tied to technological superiority, that there should be no antitrust check on dominant firm behavior. Rather, the question is how to weigh the risk that dominant firms can, can that came to dominance because they offered better products or services will stultify and decay over time, but nonetheless block competition and innovation by means of, of their existing dominance. 
From the historical record of capitalist economies, I would suggest drawing the following lessons to inform this regulatory calculus. First, the shelf life of dominance isn't measured in centuries or in human lifetimes or even half centuries. It tends to be measured in decades. Second, the cause of displacement of dominance is superior technology. Dominance is only as good as the technology under management. Third, disruption often comes from outside the market, not in the market. So an antitrust policy designed to make the internal functioning of the market more competitive, however beneficial in terms of static efficiency or maybe even incremental dynamic efficiency within the market, is neither necessary nor helpful to the gales of creative destruction that blow from outside and swamp the entire market. Fourth, regulatory policy should be focused less on neutering dominance and more on breeding innovation. Let me say that again. Regulatory policy should be fo focused less on neutering dominance and more on breeding innovation. And then fifth, there's only so much that antitrust law can contribute to this venture of breeding innovation, but an awful lot that law more generally can contribute, and it's mostly those boring things that Christine Wilson talked about, right? Protecting property and contract rights properly calibrating intellectual property rights, guarding against regulatory barriers to innovation, and enabling efficient capital markets, including the free transferability of productive assets. In sum, antitrust law can afford a degree of modesty with respect to long-run monopoly power. Diamonds may be forever, but dominance is not. Now, just to conclude, what I haven't talked about is the other side of the error cost framework, uh, the damage to efficiency and consumer welfare by having too heavy an antitrust hand. I trust that we'll hear more about that from others uh, today. So that's all I have to say, and I'm happy. I think we have time for questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Dan. That was uh, amazing. Um, so uh, you right on time, so we have time in for uh, some questions. Are there any questions? Yes, Richard. Uh, um, I'm just gonna come in late, so I, I had to miss some of this, but I'm gonna ask you the following question. Uh, how do you understand the anatomy of failure? Um, that is, what you do is you kind of point to the fact that when you look at these cases, you get a period in decades. And the question is this because of personality, because of structure and so forth. So. One of the things you always worry about in these corporations is the great man theory. Um, you don't succeed without great men. Uh, you know, one of the things I always like to do to people is I said, tell me the first name of the following companies. Uh, Boeing. And you know his first name was Arch, right? And Chrysler. Do you know his first name was Walter? And so far you go. And so the question that you're starting to ask is, if you have these characters, is the situation that we have here a problem of necessary truth or is it a problem of succession? That is what you do is you start with some guy and then what happens is they get old and they don't leave or they get old and they do leave. And in either way, it's bad. So to give you a private firm or an illustration, take something like NASA, right, NASA? And you know, they had a huge run, right, in the 60s and 70s. And I was told at the time, the average age of the team that was put together when they launched the moonshot was around 32, 33 years of age. And then you get these same guys hanging around the same firm in the year 2000, and they're a bunch of dinosaurs, and they can't do anything right. So the question is, is this a problem which you can identify as one of systematic um, succession? Or is it from the way in which your talk seemed to go sort of, oh, kind of random set of events. Look what happened to this one. Look what happened to that one. You didn't give a teleological or causal explanation for any of the particular things that you were talking about. And so uh, as somebody who would like to, as it were, add another 10 years to my life, if I'm an athlete, I know how to train, but if I'm a corporation, what is it that I'm supposed to do? Because I agree with you, this is not the antitrust laws problem. This is the internal succession problem. And do you have any idea from these anecdotes, which you know so well, as to actually the way that that thing plays out? Richard, if I knew the answer to your question, I would be very, very wealthy. And I know that. I, I'm not. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I do, do think... I'll go, well, can you speculate, you know, those <laughs> who can do and get a lot of money, but you teach, right? And I do so teach. What I, want you to I try. Know is when, and you're now sitting here as a teacher. If you would have sought to talk to some of these characters, 
um, what would you ask them and what would you hear? I mean, I actually kind of like the hypothesis that I put on the table. I don't like it in another sense, given that I'm in my 54th year of teaching. Uh, but on the other hand, I never had any market power anyhow, right? So I, I certainly do think that uh, leadership uh, in these companies matters and, and, and personalities matter. I, mean, I think, you know, Jack Welch coming back to GE, which was a company on the decline and turning it around. And we've seen what's happened since Jack Welch's departure, right? So I, I do think that there are certainly, or, you know, Henry Ford's influence over Ford. So I, I certainly think yeah, that there are- And they had to card him out at the end, remember? Yeah. And Montgomery Ward. Yeah. So I certainly think there's a story about uh, when we think about organizations, we, we may over may over claim about organizational structures and under claim about the importance of individual people mm -hmm. in organizations. I, I, no doubt that's part of it, I guess. Yeah, but again, to, 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 to the limits of my actual uh, competence here, I, the, the point I, I would like to leave is that regardless of how it happens, it the idea, happens. well, and, and it will always happen that the company will not remain dominant for very much longer than its technological superiority lasts. I mean, that's the key story. So however it is that internally, the company loses its, its technological advantage. Uh, I think the history of capitalism suggests that that dominance will not last very long after that. Now, do you have a theory to explain why churches and universities tend to last far longer? Uh, tradition? <laughs> no, 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 come on. Oh, uh, th I mean, th investment Richard. strategies, organizational structure, lack of great men and women running or whatever it is. But, you know, this is worldwide, right? You name the 20 largest institutions in the United States in terms of longevity. I don't think there's a single private business that's on that list. You ask a good question. Uh, mm -hmm. I, do, I, I do think there's something to reputation, tradition, and culture that matters a lot. I mean, you know, I, I look at Yale Law School today, which well, that's a case of decline. Well, it and so here's the, so here's the question: if, if Yale Law School does not innovate, how long will it take for them to decline? No, that's the I, wrong question. If Yale Law School does innovate, how long will it take it to decline? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, speaking about a competitor, uh, certainly one observes that th there is a need for innovation in that school today? No, I mean, I think it's a return to basics. And, and, and to take it, perhaps to Yes, and now, by the way, Mr. Crane, what course did you take that prepared you best for your modern discussions? All three of, the, of those I took from you. And what was one of them? Um, intellectual Foundations of Property. Yeah, it's one of these historical courses going back to uh, the Absolutely. <laughs> My point about history and, and tradition, Richard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always nice to have your students <laughs> on panel. I think that just underlined the importance of entrepreneurs, right? The, uh, the Well, academic the entrepreneurs do it. I mean, look, my view about this is I think these all these religious authors, authorizations is that the, basically they're trying to appeal to kind of stable set of values with highly diversified internal operations. And so they are not technologically dependent on anything in particular. And they succeed or fail depending upon their succession skills. So the counterexample to Richard Epstein is if you start looking at, say, the Northern versus the Southern Baptist, right? And you take their memberships 120 years ago and you take their membership today, uh, the Northern Baptists die, the Southern Baptists flourish, right? If you look at all the standard you know, Protestant denominations, most of them have gone by the wayside. And it's because they all became radical. Actually, William Sloan Coffin. You know, you win the war and then you lose the church, as it were. And so I think, in fact, what you really want to do when you write your next paper, right, is to try to figure out how the same analysis applies to the nonprofit sector. And if I can, I will, Richard. <laughs> well, I'll be ready to grade you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's uh, that was a very. Oh, any other questions? Daniel, if you, you have any questions, yep, you want to No, I was going to ask Richard about NYU Law School and uh, what's going to happen with innovation and antitrust, but that, that would be a longer story, Richard. Well, it's a much longer story, but I will tell you we're in the midst of a succession discussion having to do with the choice of deans, right? And that's and, uh, true of every law school. I mean, centralized organizations with highly powerful individuals. It says, I mean, look, the story on management, uh, when I worked on the University of Chicago and these presidential search committees and so forth, 
Everybody understood that the single most important function of the board of trustees at that university was the selection of the next president. I mean, interesting, that is, what, what we tend to do as academics, we tend to treat the firm as a black box. But anybody who's ever worked in a firm understands that the appointment power and the succession power is just hugely important. And I think it's perfectly consistent with Dan's story, right? Uh, and certainly every time I've been involved in a university, it's been exactly that dynamic, um, which has determined the success or failure of, of organizations. That's why people spend more time on that than they spend on anything else, um, whether it's for big organizations or for small organizations. And I think what you have, is, I do think the succession story, too soon, too late, too wrong. Now, let me mention one other thing. You ever read the book, Good to Great? Jim Collins? Everybody should read it. What he does is he talks about all these wonderful corporations and why they're at the top of the pops one day after another, right? And then 15 years later, you look back and what do you discover? Half those corporations are gone. Yeah. That's right? a, a you, Professor Crane explaining. And if you can relate to um, Chris Jensen, uh, Innovator's Dilemma, you know, the, the how the innovators rise to the top and then innovators themselves are disrupted. Yeah, and, or it can relate to the fact these companies are so well run and they're sufficiently small that they become very attractive merger targets. They're mm -hmm. taken over, then when they're congealed with somebody else, they lose their distinctive aura and they tend to become go down, and, which is why it is, I think, Dan, you would agree with this. I'm going to just stop on this note, is that the choice as to whether or not a small company go public by an IPO or by way of acquisition through a larger firm is actually a very important part of this story. And that what happens is, we make initial public offerings too difficult, so we get too many acquisition cases, which really dampens innovation. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I certainly agree that the, the choice of, of build versus buy is a critically competitively important one. And I just note that right now that the Justice Department and FTC in considering their merger guidelines revisions have a question in their, uh, their, 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 their request for information precisely about whether there should be a presumption that a company that would be able to internally replicate uh, the external acquisition should be, you know, should be prohibited yeah. from making the oh, internal. By the way, just as a thing, Adam and I, we have a little letter out there, uh, which disputes the way in which the Justice Department wants to look at this. Yeah. That is, they always want to prohibit one instead of opening up both and letting markets decide which way to go. And I, I just agree with you in the sense that I think that there, it, it is possible that a company could replicate by building internally and yet do so more slowly, more expensively, and in a way that's actually less beneficial to, I agree. to the consumer. There's no so, dominant yeah. solution. And so therefore, you don't want the FDA making recommendations, uh, the FTC making recommendations. I think we're, we're done with the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was that is a great discussion and conversations. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Crane, for your contributions. And also